right. Chris, take it away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's Friday. It's cold. It He's is warm. warm. I'm oh, cold. God. I'm it sweating. Is. Got my aperture scarf again. What's up? Uh-huh. All right, guys. Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a new boss room. It's amazing we're actually here. Yes. Because Snowpocalypse. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. Well, it's been it's been kind of fucking with the momentum as developers, because, yes. like, you know, Dan and I were talking about this, and, like, we had it last week, too. It's like, you know, the team gets going on a Monday, and it's the trains going chugga 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 chugga, then boom, snow to the face. And, you know, North Carolina can't really deal with this shit. You know, I mean, Boston has been drowning, and you know, to be fair. Um, but it's like the secondary roads get fucked, and then people can't get into work. And our policy is, like, if you, you like, don't come in if it's, like, slick at all, because it's not worth dying for. Um, and then, of course, you know, the momentum started up again, and then another snow day. But we're here. We're surviving. We will rebuild. We did it. And we have a new uh, guest this oh. week on the show. It's uh, Dan Nani. Dan, tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Sure, yeah. yeah. So I work here as a uh, systems designer. I'm just working on all the gameplay systems, whether it be you know, metagame, UI, it could be uh, you know the uh, things that shoot the guns. It's a little bit of everything that we actually deal with in the gameplay. Office buddies. Yay. Yeah, we work a lot. With, I work a lot with Cliff these days. And uh, so where I started from uh, originally is I, I started out as an intern game designer late 2000. Uh, worked on uh, ATV Off-Road Fury, Motocross Madness 2, just kind of doing what your intern game designer would do, which is usually QA testing. And uh, from that point on, graduated college, and I got in as an environment artist. And, uh, oh, cool. I, I really loved uh, design, though. Design was where I really had my, my heart set. So environment art was a, a way to kind of deal with my creative side and uh, really focus in on level design and, and uh, just kind of expand my portfolio there. Uh, so I've been doing it for the last almost 15 years now. Le- leaving out kills on Battlefield. Yeah, well, I was going to get to that part. Right, right, right. right. Also, I know, 15 years. Hitters. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the beginning of it because after the beginning, it kind of got a little rough. You know, things like Engage kind of creep into my uh, resume, which I'd like to forget. <laughs> uh, Side talking. Yeah, well, you know, things Taco happen. Fold. You, you, you got you to pay the bills sometimes, right? But uh, no, I, my, my break was getting into the Battlefront series, working at Pandemic Studios, working on Star Wars Battle Battlefront. That was really fun. Uh, after that, it kind of grew. I, I went and actually did a little bit of teaching just for some time, just kind of see how that was. Then I got into uh, Killzone with uh, Aryan. I worked with him over at Gorilla Games in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, then I worked on the Battlefield series for the last couple of years. Uh, kind of got in with Visceral at the end when they were working on, um, they were helping out with the Battlefield 3 uh, DLC. Uh, then I helped out with some Battlefield 4 stuff, mainly the spectator uh, feature of it and working with the esports producers. And, uh, yeah, then Battlefield Hardline is what I spent my uh, last few years really focusing heavily on. And cool. Now we have uh, Blue Streak. Now we have Blue Streak. Have Blue Streak. So we got a lot we're going to talk about. We're going to watch, uh, in a little bit, a PAX East promo, because we are going to PAX East, but yeah, more about that later. Cool. Oh, yeah. And it's something else. <laughs> it's... I have no idea the stuff that he does. No. It's just as new to me as it is to you in the roles. So. I don't show anybody the office before it happens, and then it just happens. So oh, I was here for some of it. Uh, yeah, that was an interesting review with uh, the man behind the camera. Yeah, so it should, it should, uh, it should, we'll see that in a little bit. Um, but we're going to talk about some industry stuff. Um, also, the Let's Play. We did the Let's Play of The Order in the office, um, yep. and we're going to show you guys, or we're actually going to tell you, uh, what games are going to be playing next in the office because we actually had a lot of fun with that. N4G lost their shit on that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Flame they, on, flame a, on, fuckers. There was a seven page NeoGAF post about that too. So, yeah, let's actually let's go ahead and jump into that. So, um, we had a lot of fun doing the order, and it's we did it because we were we were curious and we got, a, cop- we, we, a, we got a copy of the game. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I said a lot of what my honest-to-God feelings were about it, and we have to be tricky because, as you know, this is a small industry, and there's a very good chance somebody from, was it Ready at Dawn, I think, is Mm -hmm. going to be at GDC next week and be like, dude, come on, I'm like... I know, I was a little snarky with it, but part of that is playing a character as far as, like, you know, entertaining an audience that's watching the stream. But, I mean, the the genre of a cover shooter is near and dear to me, so I had some good things to say, I had some not-so-good things, you know, and, you know, it's hard to sometimes come not come across as an asshole with that. Well, yeah. but as gamers, though, I mean, we were as interested and curious yep. about the game, especially with all the press that came out about it being really short because it leaked early and all that stuff. I mean, we were as curious as everyone was. I mean, so. and, and, and at the end, we're gamers. We just want to play these games, and we have a as gamers, as we do with developers as well, but did you? I didn't actually hear your thoughts on the game itself. And the game, so you have to put you in the hot seat. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I watched you guys play a good bit of it, and for me, I, I don't do the five-hour shooters very well. Just it's it's one of those things where I enjoy 
my style of gameplay these days are more RPG. Mm. Um, I like getting... Uh, you know, uh, we're building a shooter here, right? Oh, I do! But see, <laughs> see, I'm a systems designer, right? I so I get all the spreadsheets and I get all the numbers behind the scenes and that's what I like building. I like actually seeing seeing balance work in the interplay. That was and, a good dodge, uh, by the way. Yeah, well, thanks. thanks. <laughs> well, the, 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 part of the argument about the game was the five-hour length. That you know, I saw George Broussard on Twitter said that he beat it in eight. So five hours is the, like, I'm going to burn through this game as fast as humanly possible. It's like, I'm going to get an In-N-Out burger and instead of enjoying it, I'm going to eat it as quick as I can to show how fucking cool I am mentality. Um, and, you know, the, the length isn't necessarily a bad thing. The problem is, I, I've said before and I'll say again, is the state of the market. If you have something that's, and it looks friggin' great, it's a system seller in many ways for Sony, but, you know, it's the kind of game you play once and then you trade it in for another game, or you rent in Redbox. And that is a huge problem still for this business. Yeah, it took me, I think I beat it in about six and a half, seven hours. You actually beat it? Mm-hmm. Uh, so did you get to the brothel scene? I, well, there's multiple times you go to the brothel, but there is, there is <laughs> multiple, multiple times you there's, or, uh... there's, full frontal, <laughs> there's, there's full frontal nudity. Yeah, you hear this, there's, nudity. I hear there's this like, scene where, like, you bust into the brothel, yeah. and this dude jumps up, and his, like, schwanz is, like, swinging around it's, or anything? <laughs> yeah. What'd you call that? Schwanz. schwanz. <laughs> so about that. Okay, um, you know some artist <laughs> at Radio Dawn's going, oh, damn it. He's but, like... All right, let's make it yeah, a little veinier. Anyway, uh, um, Digital Dick did not think we'd be talking about that. The DD. Yeah. Double um, yeah, and I didn't want it to be any longer. It, I didn't. The length didn't bother me. It was just kind of the core game. Well, the, the problem is, is games know this whole rental mentality, so they do padding. You know, and it's like, oh, you went all the way across yep. the level, now go all the way back. Or repeat the same level in order to kind of artificially bloat it. And uh, we as developers can smell that a fucking million miles away. The thing it, is, it annoys the shit out of us. With five hours, with, with, okay, I'm not going to say five hours because it wasn't obviously five hours for everybody, but with short shooters like that, the problem I have as a gamer is the intensity level is always at peak. Uh, I like having a storyline. I like having things kind of take me out, kind of pull the momentum back a bit. Yeah, you want the peaks and the valleys. Exactly. And I don't want it to be the cutscenes that do that. I want it to be the gameplay that actually lets me kind of take a step back, breathe, play around with something a little bit, figure a little bit more of the game out through like a puzzle mechanic or something. Yep. And I just generally find that when it's a short game, it's really high intensity and... I don't know, I just can't sustain that peak when I, was, I remember talking to Jason and Vince back when they were at uh, Infinity Ward and doing Call of Duty about their campaigns, and they were worried that some of the Modern Warfare and other campaigns were always at 11. Yeah. You know, because it's that, like, it, that way. If you're, you, got, you ever know that person who just screams all the time, eventually you just tune them out. It's like, and it's the same thing with cursing. If, you know, I have the problem of cursing too much. A well-placed curse can really have a lot of impact on somebody, right? Mm-hmm. But Whereas if you just say it all the time, the words lose their meaning, like with South Park said mm-hmm. shit that one time. So it's just, it's the basic shooter, single-player cadence of, you know, having occasional, like, exploration, occasional kind of walking and talking, and then occasional, you know, all hell breaking loose. And it's really finding that, that, that cadence is a, it's a hard thing to do. It is. Nice. Yeah, but we had a lot of fun doing it. A lot yeah, of people we're going to do more. In. We're going to do more. So with that, we're going to do uh, Battlefield Hardline. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes out, we're going to yeah. do. We're going to stream us playing it on launch day. I believe it's Tuesday the seventeenth. I could be wrong. It's going to be a fun one because yeah. both Dan and Arjan worked on it, and they're going to be yep. able to do the whole like, oh, a lot, that changed. They're originally that was supposed to be. Yeah, well, hopefully, without pissing off EA too much. To be fair, though, we didn't work too much on single player. I had a little bit of a, a hand on the progression in the metagame for a little while until we started working with another team, okay. mostly multiplayer stuff. But uh, it'll be fun because a lot of it's going to be... Uh, Filmic? Yeah, well, it's going to be stuff that we haven't gotten a, seat to, a, a, a chance to kind of really dive deep into, yeah. so it'll be a nice experience. I think it'll be fun. Yeah, yeah and, then, and then later in the month, we're going to do Bloodborne, which I know you're not you're not a big Dark Souls guy. I'm fucking terrible at it. But I think <laughs> you don't like smacking yourself in the head. I, I, appreci- <laughs> I, ap- I appreciate what they're doing because they made a yeah, game that actually challenges you, whereas like the, my work on the Gears franchise kind of massaged down the idea of challenge and exploration and prove to me, gamer, that you actually learn how to do this one attack, right? Yeah. And so that's this that, the rubber band going in the opposite direction of gamers wanting to be beaten over the head, which I respect. I'm just be forewarned if we wind up doing this, I'm going to be fucking terrible. Well, we have a... You we have a, controllers? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we have a bunch of guys in the office who absolutely, myself yeah. included, love Dark Souls, really, really excited about Bloodborne, so I think it's going to be a lot of fun for us to do Did you ever see the, the Dark Souls mod where it changed the you died to thanks Obama? <laughs> No. It's the greatest thing ever. Look it up on YouTube. Maybe we can tag out. We can do. We can tag out. Yeah, and I during just, it, if it, I, I can just like, oh, I can't do this anymore. I'm getting fucking killed. I'm just not that good with that type of game. I'm more of a patience. I'm more of a first person shooter guy. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cool. We'll see. So look for those. We'll be doing those <clears throat> on launch day, and then follow uh, you know at Bosky on Twitter for updates whenever we're going to do those during the day. We're not sure yet, but uh, on launch day we will be streaming those games and more in the future. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. So uh, it's been two weeks since our last uh, our last show, um, and a bunch of stuff happened with this rock paper shotgun interview with Peter Molyneux. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the whole Gotis thing. 
Uh, let's talk about that a little bit, because I know you have some opinions on it. I consider Peter to be a friend, um, so take that, take this with a grain of salt. I think the writer was being, on one hand, his intent was there. His mm -hmm. execution, he was a fucking dick. Yeah. And like, and the thing about Peter is Peter's a dreamer. And Peter just so happens sometimes, fairly often, to dream a little bit too big and to sell that dream. And the accent doesn't hurt as well. <laughs> um, and so he's delivered you know, a, a great myriad of games over the course of his career. And he's finding his footing again in this new world order of Kickstarters, mm -hmm. transparency, the, train, the clusterfuck that's mo mobile right now, uh, as well as trying to please everybody at the same time. And so he's having to adjust to this new world order as a designer who's existed for 20, 30 years in this business. And, you know, I understand gamers getting frustrated with him, especially when it comes down to real people's money, but I still think the execution on the writer, if, if a writer, a journalist comes up to me and says something like that, fuck you, the interview's done. Like, I'm not talking to you again. Like, Peter, I don't know why he put up with it. Um, there's ways to ask really people deep. something like that without being a dick. And that's, it. I'm the, I personally find it, very uh, abrasive the subject for me because I've been at the, the the other end of that where it's like, yeah. can you tell me why your game sucks? And you just want to punch the fucking journalist in the face and like you just sit there like, yeah, I don't really feel comfortable answering that right now. And here's the other thing I know I'm ranting about this: the press is still important, but no offense to all my journalist friends, it's, they're not as important as they used to be, be in a world in which social and YouTubers have completely fucking taken over. On any given evening, click on a random trending topic worldwide on YouTube, on Twitter, and it's some uh, Justin Bieber looking YouTuber kid who made some funny comments that everyone's fucking losing their shit about. That's where we live now, so keep that in mind. Anyway, I'm, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I mean, what, what is your perspective on it, Dan? So the thing is, I, I think Peter Molyneux is any game designer. We all want to make the best game possible. We want to come up with brand new ideas. We want to come up with the, the greatest secret sauce ever, right? The difference is, is, you know, with things like Kickstarter and open development, you have to bring that out to the open much earlier than you might have anticipated. You don't really have a chance to actually build it and try it out first before you have to sell the public on something that you want to get them to invest into, right? You can sell a publisher, keep it behind the scenes, work on it for a while, iterate, and then release what you've got. But in Kickstarter, you have to be up front right from the beginning. Yeah, and I think this goes back to what Cliff said earlier, and I, I agree, is that he comes from a different school of doing things, and this is kind of new, this is a new way of, of publishing and developing a game, right? Yep. And there's some wiggle room that he's trying to navigate, and I think people are giving him a lot of shit for it. They yeah. are. Um, it's just one of those things, man. It's like uh, we're internally struggling with how transparent we can be yep. with what we're doing, mm -hmm. because working with... Nexon, who's our publisher and is funding the studio, you know, they're like, well, there, there might be other ways to do this, and we're actually going to have a meeting soon to kind of discuss this, because we've shown some stuff, but nowhere near as much as we want to. But this whole thing with Peter makes me a little terrified to be transparent mm. as well, so we, we really have to find that midway point of how, how transparent we are with the game and the, and the features and the development. Yeah. And also, I mean, you put something out there, and if there's a, a cool idea, it's, it's, and I hate to sound paranoid, but it's always like somebody could like, oh, I can code that in my game in five minutes. You know, yeah. just like throw it, it's the next thing, you know, shows that easy call dude. <laughs> Depending on the feature, Man. you know what I mean. Right? Yeah. Somebody who has you know a t an army of five hundred people, right? Yeah. And we're just you know thirty one right now, right? So Red Hat Yellow from chat says, uh, but the interview was a lot more fun to read with asshole questions. Do you feel like that these well, reality reality TV is more entertaining when exactly. the, the Real Housewives are pulling each other's fucking hair off and kicking each other and you know the vag like that's. That's entertainment in general, right? Like, well, you know, back in the day, we did the little like specials on like Ed and Inside at Epic. You know, they're trying to like make a reality TV thing about it. It's like, no, we actually pretty much got along. Like, there wasn't any fights, which is terrible TV. So, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's also saying, but Peter deserved to be called out. I mean, do you think that some? Could there have been a better way of doing it? Of, that, that, my whole point was not. It was. It was the journalist's execution in how he called Peter out, not the fact that he called him out. Right. So allow me to repeat that. Peter has been, sure. you know, he, he's been very vocal with what his, you know he's been saying about his games. He's a huge dreamer, uh, sometimes too much. And when it comes with other people's money with Kickstarter, yeah, yeah they have a right to be offended. But yeah. there's ways of uh, addressing another human being professionally, right? That's I'm just gonna leave it at that. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on to a, a lot less uh, um, inflammatory subject. But uh, Majora's Mask, I, I, I actually I played it back on the N64. I know this is a weird kind of uh, segue, but that's it's a great game. It's, uh, so Dan... I've never played it. Is that <laughs> nothing? I haven't played it. I'm going to call that and out right I now. I know you wanted out. to talk about it, and <laughs> well, I'm playing it. And so, you know, Zelda for me is top-down Zelda. Like, I played the original Zelda being older. Um, I, I fucking loved it. Uh, I've always, that theme still, you know, gives me kind of goosebumps. Um, and then, you know, when they made the transition to 3D on the N64, 
like Wind Waker, all those games, they kind of lost me a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, the ca I was struggling with the camera. I didn't, I didn't it just, it, it just yeah. didn't really feel like... And then this new art direction came in. I can't remember the, the gentleman or the, the person responsible for this kind of new style that came in, um, which didn't feel like Zelda to me as well. But then playing this game, it's clearly a Zelda game, and, you know, playing it on the 3DS, like... It asks something of you, you know, talking about Demon Souls and Dark Souls. Like, mm. it, it, there's a little hint cave you can crawl into, but you feel shameful when you use that thing. Like, they give you the world, and you're like, go. Well, it out. and the time limit. The right? time limit the is time a limit, motherfucker. Until you learn how to manipulate it, because you okay. can you can effectively manipulate it, and yeah. it's like it's like Groundhog Day, Groundhog Day, which is a really cool mechanic. But, but the, I mean, it gets tricky because there's nested objectives in there where you know there's the plant lady with the, the little thing, and then you have to get the deed for her. Then you go to the swamp, and like that completely resets itself if you reset. So, yeah, some stuff does, some stuff doesn't, and it's not. It, it's very gray. They don't do. I mean, it's an older game, so they don't do this huge exposition on explaining it all to you. Yeah, you just kind of have to which is figure fine. it out or buy the strategy guide. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> where the game was built to buy the fucking strategy guide because uh, this was back when Nintendo didn't really have gameplay counselors anymore if I recall where you could call yeah, and be like I actually did <laughs> call some extreme yeah, dude yeah, exactly. yeah. ask your parents first yeah right, exactly right. Um, the image of this kid with his collar up like looking like very 80s and 90s um, <laughs> but yeah I mean I, I'm, I'm sticking with it and uh, apparently the boss battles are just rough too because uh, my wife was just screaming last night playing it the, pissing off the dogs because uh, Zelda bosses are always fucking tricky mm -hmm. and once you learn the pattern and the cadence it's easy but learning that can be immensely frustrating um, it's a puzzle. but I mean yeah. the, the, the whole setup is like you're in this weird world I don't even know what the explanation is but the, the moon is being sucked down because there's this mischievous scarecrow character that has this powerful mask and all of your different abilities are different masks you put on and the art direction alone has some of the most unique looking characters I've ever seen in a game period even the moon is just fucking terrifying looking down you you look up and it's just sitting there gl it's, like glaring at you right? it's a very dark zelda game yeah. and it's and it's like it's just bizarre and trippy well this is the one that introduced the tingle character right i believe so yeah, yeah which i wasn't even familiar <laughs> with which is the, like this like uh pansexual uh alcoholic fucking Floor. fairy character right like and he just shows up and he was in all these internet memes a while back and i was like what the fuck is that from <laughs> and it's like the, whoever the art director the creative director was it's just it's some crazy next level Japanese shit. It's cool. It's uh, I'm glad that there's a whole new generation of people being able to play this game. Well, we look, which, we, is, which is cool. You know, you watch the Super Bowl, you see the ads for Game of Fucking War, Game of War, Game of War. Kate Upton, we get it. Um, <laughs> you know, even Clash of Clans. You know, Boom Beach and all that stuff. And then here's the New World Order where mobile is. Everyone loves loves, loves mobile. And then here's just a, a game that's just a goddamn Zelda game that's pure. And I'm okay with that. I'm sounding really fucking old right now. <laughs> Want to go back to the old days, huh? Well, I mean, nostalgia is a drug, right? The, yeah. What I always like, I always say is, you know, we spend the first eighteen years of our life rushing to get to it, and the rest of it trying to claw the right the back, right the hell back. So check out Zelda; it's great. I'm enjoying it, and it's great to have it on mobile. So I'll when still, I'm traveling, I got it. I will still yes. always dearly love Nintendo, no matter what. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, so this is kind of a departure. We're moving away from uh, from the game stuff, but uh, our your good friend. Neil Blomkamp. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, Blomkamp. I don't know. He followed me on Twitter finally. Nice. And so did Mark Miller, um, so, which was like incredibly flattering. The first thing he tweets me about is gives me shit that my copy of his new comic that I tweeted looked bent. I'm like, sorry, Mark <laughs> Miller. Um, but yeah, Neil Blomkamp. Um, I fucking loved District 9. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. Elysium hated. And he actually came out, if you saw in the news, he's like, yeah, I... It, uh, it, I fucked up. I didn't hate it. I, it, was, it was not nearly as good as District 9. That's, it, that's the, it, Well, I mean, it's tough shoes to fill, it right? Is, very much. Um, but, I mean, the, this was like this whole project where he was going to do the new alien that was the alien we all wanted. Like, yeah. No I'm, offense to Fincher. Like, mm -hmm. Mm. Well, I mean, he released, so in early 2015, he released these images, yep. which is like, eh, it'd be nice to do this. And everyone's just like... <gasps> Yeah, seriously. <laughs> just lost their shit, like, yep. seeing Michael Bean with, like, the, the uh, side of his face, like, scarred yeah, from the... Like, how did he survive that... Yeah. Uh, was it, wasn't it Michael Bean the one who uh, did, the, did the grenade? Or how did he... No, 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 no. That was... Uh, was it the acid attack? It was the acid. It, it, he, got sprayed, he got sprayed yeah. with acid whenever the door was closing. He held the That's door right. open and shot the alien. I yeah. love aliens. I love the no. franchise. Yeah, yeah. And if you, yeah, and if you talk to... Probably, I would say, what, 90% of the people in the game industry, mm -hmm. a lot of people will say, I love aliens. The amount so of influence he, on that, yes. on the, from Doom to oh, yeah. everything. 
Um, and Alien and so, Aliens, both yeah, of those are just amazing. So that's why I think this is really important that, you know, for people who love the franchise, finally get that sequel to Aliens yeah. that everyone's been asking for. So we just like to ignore yeah. Alien 3 onwards? No, they're disregarding <laughs> that entire I know, I'm, chunk. I'm so, I'm but so it's so not happy. Michael Bay, you know, yeah. it's not Brett fucking Ratner. Like, I mean, this is the guy to do it. Yeah, yeah. This and is the guy to do it. I do remember being extraordinarily pissed off when Alien 3 came out, so excited for it, went to see it. And I walked out of that movie mad. Yeah, it was one of those first experiences where I really wanted my money and time yep. back. Yep, yep. Um, but I felt like it just destroyed the previous two movies. I think it was uh, from the first couple. Of I minutes think that too. was the one that Joss Whedon did some ghostwriting on as well. Did he? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, okay, now we're on a prison planet. Like, there's no guns. Um, you got was it Charles S. Dutton just yelling, <laughs> "Run, bitch, run!" <laughs> and then like she jumps in the lava at the end because she yeah. has an alien in her. Like, it's just you know the only good thing from that movie for me personally was just the one shot where the aliens right next to her salivating. Mm-hmm. Well, it's an iconic shot, right? Yeah, 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 that was great. But otherwise, just, pfft, done. I'm really excited to see what he does with the weapons. Yeah, that's what? one of the things that I excites me the most because I District Nine and the weapons. I mean. I'm not a gun nut, but I appreciate them from a, a gameplay perspective. Well, for I video mean, games, we, we right? chase the whole tangible sci-fi yeah. thing, right? And that's you know, Greg Broadmoor uh, is actually a friend of mine over at Weta. Um, he does you know those uh, Doctor Grodboard's guns that I have mm-hmm. in the office and everything. Fucking love all of his work. Um, fierce beard of that guy too for a Kiwi. <laughs> and he uh, he you know he did all of those guns and the Mac, which is still in my opinion one of the best Macs ever created. And uh, I rewatched it a few months ago and it completely holds up. Yep. The CG and everything, it's worth rewatching. The sound effects, fucking prawns. Yeah. So everyone, give your support to Neil. Like. I want this Aliens film to be everything that we want it to be. We're getting, the, we're, we're getting the Star Wars sequels we wanted, you know, and, and, this, and in one corner, we're getting the Alien sequel we wanted, and then just Transformers is still lumbering along. Oh, Transformers. Thanks, China. Yeah. Cool. All right, so uh, we're running a little bit behind here, but that's fine. We've got wiggle room. It's Friday. It's wiggle, all good. Huh? Wiggle, wiggle. The potions, too. You get a lot more wiggle room. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, we got some questions, and Dan, this is, you know, great yep. to have you here. Um, some of these are simple, some of these are a little more complicated, sure. but, uh, you know, on our Facebook page, Justin Wall, um, asked, uh, sticky or regular frag grenades, or both? Why I mean, just two? I, I'd go even more, sticky, frag, uh, what we were just talking about, ones that actually blow up and create little micro grenades. Cluster you know, grenades. Cluster grenades, right? Curving grenades. Yeah. I, they, for me, grenades are, uh, one of those things where, uh, why just have one? Uh, let's try it. Let's try a lot of different things, especially if you're looking at it from a, a balanced perspective. If everybody's the same grenade, that's fine. Call of Duty does a great it's real world and stuff. But then you have incendiary grenades. Then you have smoke grenades. Then you have whatever it is. Each one has a different you could do uh, EMPs, EMPs, aspect, EMPs, all EMPs, everything. So yeah, for me, it's um, it's whatever is useful for the game and whatever is fun. If it kind of sells a feature and it sells a style of style of game, then let's let's add it in. And I mean, it's one of those things. You know, we talk about the, the arena shooter DNA of this game, but having you know. It's fundamentally fun to see the first person down the barrel view and then just see a hand just fucking softball pitch that thing over the shoulder. That's just fun. And that's one of the FPS advancements that I think we'll actually consider taking forward as we're doing this game, right? Yeah. Cool. On Twitter, uh, Corey Tibbetts. Corey Tibbetts. Corey uh, Tibbetts. Corey Tibbetts. Welcome to Hogwarts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Corey. I, I love you. Um, and this this is a great question because I think this is, this is a huge thing. Um, he asks... Uh, will there be ways to get player-created stuff in the game, like on the Steam Workshop or PS2 Player Studio? Um, I mean, I don't think we know yet at this point, but, I mean... I mean, it's a little bit of a, you know, put the cart before the horse, because mm-hmm. we want to make a fun game that... Got to make know, the content first. Yeah, right? I mean, and but, one of our goals, I'm going to keep saying over and over again, is, you know, to make a free-to-play PC shooter that your average shooter player who doesn't play free-to-play goes... Yeah, I don't normally play free to play, but I'm gonna give that a go. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, you know, let's just make a great game first. You know, obviously, I said before we're fans of mods, fans of user generated content, all the stuff Valve's doing with the Steam mm-hmm. Workshop is fucking amazing. You're crowdsourcing this content. People, are, there's people making full time money on the Steam Workshop, making all the, this content. It's a beautiful thing. Um, gets Gabe more knives. What can we say? It also expands your community. Your community is there for a long time. Yeah, you yeah, get yeah. Kind of no, invested I think it's great. All yeah. Team, yeah. Right. So, I, I'd love it. Question is, you know, let's let's make the game first and uh, see what. Uh, what we can do after yeah, this. I was like when I started talking to my wife about the game. She's like, "Are they gonna be pets?" I'm like, "Just calm the fuck down." <laughs> pets. <laughs> no dogs and oh, combat. So on our um, on our subreddit, you know, obviously this is a our subreddit is a great place to ask kind of longer form questions. So I, su- I summarize these uh, down a little bit. So new to this on our subreddit asks, as a group of creatives, um, how do you get around block like writer's block, right? Um, how is this solved at Bosky for, for everyone that works you, here? I mean, from my end, and I'll let Dan pipe in because it, 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 it's different for each creative, but it's 
that it's the downtime, right? It's like I always call it the drive home or the shower time, right? And it's one of those things like, you know, for instance, if I'm driving the car with the missus, I'll just tell her like, oh, email me and in the subject say, blue hammer uh, acid lightning. And she'll be like, well, just like, trust me. It's just, <laughs> and I'll remember it later. And then, you know, cause my email is basically my memory. But you know, it's those moments, like when you sit down and if you were to put a gun to somebody's head and be creative, it just doesn't happen. So there's mm -hmm. days where, you know, you come in and like, you know, uh, you know, I proposed a new weapon the other day to Dan that I was just skipping on the way home. Like, I haven't seen this in a game. I want to <laughs> fucking do this. This is going to be great. And there's other days I'm like, I got nothing, you know? So it's, yeah. it's really, I mean, my thing is just feed, you know, grist for the mill. You know, reading sci-fi, you mm -hmm. know, graphic novels, watching uh, good TV, good film, playing other games, and sometimes it just pops up. And some things are, like I, I like to say in the zeitgeist, you know, like different people come to the same conclusions, like when Hollywood has two asteroid movies at the same time. So that's me speaking for it. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I like talking to people. Uh, when I find yeah. that I'm in a, in a position where I just really can't think something through or there's a problem I just can't get to overcome... Uh, I'll write an email out. Sometimes, uh, as you've probably noticed, I write walls of text. I do, because this is my brain just coming coming out on paper, and I just keep on typing, and I keep on typing. Executive summary. <laughs> Sometimes, that's why I start off with the TLDR. But anyway, uh, what I try to do without doing that is kind of get everything out, and as I write it down, I think it through a little bit more, and sometimes I solve my own problems by writing it. But at the very least, there's somebody out there, like Josh, who's going to read it, and he's going to give me feedback. And he knows my thought process. He knows exactly what I went through. It's coming off, we had a snow day, and like I came back into email, and there's like a ten page thread with these two, and I'm just like, come on, yeah, dude, just yeah. get, get, wrap it up, get to the conclusion. <laughs> but I, I rather do it in person. I think one of the yeah. things as a designer, and this is why it's become a little harder when we have these snow days too, is we we do things better talking in person. We solve things a lot faster when we brainstorm in person. Tone, email sucks. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's necessary evil sometimes, but. Your tone doesn't come across. No. You you can't feel somebody's somebody enthusiasm. Like you know, for me, like when I you know proposed the name that we're hopefully going to reveal in a couple months for what this game is. You know, I remember the, the, your face when I proposed it to you and I explained it to you. You're like, ooh, and I'm like, yes, that works. <laughs> if yeah. I just sent out an email, they'd be like, what? Who wouldn't yeah. give a shit? So yeah, email necessary evil. Yeah, you know, when in, per when in doubt, go go to somebody's desk. And just fucking talk to him. Go to lunch. Yeah. You know, be in person. So cool. We'll move on to the next one. Invader Luge on our subreddit asks. Um, how do you create a game that looks great on a high-end system, but also plays well on a lower-end system? Yeah, um, I mean, we've talked about it before, being free-to-play on a PC, you need to run on a potato. Um, so we're shooting for something that looks fantastic on a great rig, but hopefully scales back and scales down to, you know, somebody in, you know, Eastern Europe who has this, like, you know, TRS-80 type uh, box. You know, mm -hmm. from a technical standpoint, though, you know, it's the engineer's problem. Yeah, I mean, it's game an important problem to solve. <laughs> yeah. For us, gameplay is king, right? I mean, yeah. it's one of those things where frame rate, frame rate, we, frame rate. we have to make sure that the game plays a certain way, whether or not it looks pretty, or it doesn't look pretty, yeah. right? So we, that's why we test the game early on, and we make sure that the levels, the gameplay, everything can work uh, in a gray box. It's not pretty to look at, but if we can say it's fun to play, uh, then whether or not it's pretty, then we can start playing around with the scale. How, how pretty can we really make it on the top end rig, and how ugly can we make it on low end rig? There's also something visually though too, right? Where like you know some of the and I, I, I cite Gears too when you're in the hollow when you're in the locust territory of being the worst example of that. Just yeah. detail everywhere, and eventually it just kind of becomes noise. I'm yeah, a big fan of keep it clean. I want to be able to spot you, you know, hundred feet out, so I can shoot you, and I'm not like, is that a bush? I don't fucking know, right? right. Um, and that's the, the big clarity of experience is something that I always hammer on in anything I work on. And I'm you also look at games like Valve games. Uh, you look at Blizzard games, and they're really great silhouetting. Uh, you get understanding from a distance, yep. animation, uh, particle effects. Uh, you understand what's occurring at any point of the game, and they don't have to invest in, in uh, you know, high poly or yep. anything crazy. It's just it's very, very legible. So to wrap things up for our questions, uh, this is a good one for you. Isaac Redfield on our, on our subreddit asks, how is statistical data gathering a part of development and does it happen from the beginning? Uh, ideally, yeah, it does. Uh, the problem is, is usually you have to build that in, so, so you have to build in some sort of telemetry into your system so you can actually gather all of that data. Uh, before that, we might start a survey. We might just get some internal feedback or people that have been playing and trying to get them to actually get some sort of non-biased feedback they like all go into their different rooms, report, yeah. give us some feedback, and then talk about it later on so we get more of that gut reaction, that gut emotion. But you have to kind of temper everything with, uh, you know, the actual gut reaction, the understanding that I've been doing this for a long, long time, and looking at the data and actually coming to a happy medium or realizing that sometimes the data is wrong. Even though it looks like it's broken on, on, on paper, hmm. the numbers are completely off, sometimes that's right, and players won't complain about it, and you don't need to change that. It's hmm. because... There is an inherent imbalance in balance. Uh, you do want imbalance in balance. You want things to be out of, out of sync in various times. Otherwise, if it's a very 
balanced numerically game is a very flat experience. And we don't want flat experiences. That's well said. That is excellent job. I, I got nothing. Okay. Cool. Is anything you want to say before we uh, we move on? Forza Roma. That's all I want to say. There you go. Yeah. Cool, guys. So a um, soccer reference. We're gonna take a look <laughs> yes, at it this. Is. Thank you. For, <laughs> thank you for all of your uh, questions. Please keep them coming. Like I said, we're we're answering as many as we can. And uh, people from the team are actively in the subreddit, like yourself. Yep. Um, so go to our subreddit. We'll have the the URL at the end of the show. Um, and ask questions, and these guys will jump in and answer them as as they can. So. Will do. Cool. So let's take a look at this weird thing. Packs, man. Of course. <laughs> you said you wanted to go to the San Diego Comic Con, though. <clears throat> well, do people dress up at Pax? Yeah. They do. Yeah. Pax is closer, right? Yeah. Pax. I don't like flying. I gotta go with Chrono Trigger. Uh, started playing it for the first time and took down Magus last night with uh, my Chrono Frog uh, dual tech sword stream. Pretty much dominated him. I think I did about 600 damage, so gotta go with Chrono Trigger. Sorry. Uh, Pax, for sure. And Nightman was the worst show ever. It's horrible. <laughs> Hugh's a good letter, but uh, I'll have to say Pax. Uh, all right, honesty time. Uh, Dark Souls, uh, it's, way, it's way better, Dark Souls. Dark Souls is better than anything, so Dark Souls. No, I mean, I, I mean that I, I gotta say I prefer the milking because you get to see all that good stuff. it's just your fingers, you're into it, you know, you're just so yeah, so Pax, I would say, is a, a second to the milking, yeah. Uh, I like Pax better than Dirty Snow. <laughs> Let's see, I uh, don't know. Who's making the tunas? You gotta, you gotta specify on this, man. You gotta be specific. It's in Boston. That's really cold. I don't know. Baby carrots. Go with baby carrots. <laughs> okay. Ben and Jerry's is always there, so I'm gonna have to go with Pax East. Pax is just a couple times a year. And Pax. This is my friend. Dude. All right. Yeah, this will be up on YouTube, so you guys can check it out. But this is our panel details um, that you'll that you, you know we'll have on our website if you want to get more uh, in depth info on where we're going to be and all that good stuff. I mean, so. There we go. And also there's some outtakes on YouTube as well. So you may want to check that out. So, all right. Yeah, that's our, our weird PAX promo. I love PAX. It's, it's nice to, to hear people in the office laughing. So and, 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 I, I, can't, I didn't have headphones. <laughs> I'm still in the dark. Yeah, I guess it was funny. I guess I swear a lot. I, you know, I'm, you know, it was early. He, he came to me at like 7. I know. Chris, you're such a great sport. Jeez, I'm still in bed then. So, as you may notice, we have a new person here. A new challenger enters. Hey, guys. Hey, so this is, uh, this is Scott Jordan. He's uh, first time on the show. Scott, how are you? I'm doing, I'm doing better. I was almost dead a couple weeks ago. So <laughs> Welcome I'm, to I'm North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. Not dead yet. So, so. S Scott is our lead level designer here at the studio. Um, and you've got some great previous experience. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about where you came from and what you're doing here at Bosky. Sure. So uh, I got my start out in the mod community. You know, I did some work on Day of Defeat, uh, and then that got bought out by Valve, um, which is a great resume booster to get me over to Gearbox Software. Uh, and I worked on two of the Brothers in Arms games while I was there. Uh, and then I took a, ba a bit of a break from game development, uh, and then I went over to Valve and worked on TF2 for about four years. Uh, and so now I'm out here working on uh, Blue Streak. 
The, jo- the joke around the office was that we'd fire up Team Fortress 2, there'd be like carts and pumpkins and shit going on in the, ho- in the holidays. And we're like, who is doing all this? There's somebody up there doing all this crazy shit. And yeah, this guy. Might, it might have been me a little bit <laughs> on some of the stuff. So yeah. you may be wondering, it's like, what, what are you doing here, right? Um, we've debuted environment art and all that kind of stuff in the past, and it's great. We're going to do that in a, in a moment. You guys are going to see something completely brand new. But I thought it would be interesting to get your perspective as a level designer, um, you know, how, how you guys translate the process of this concept, this concept art and say, okay, we're going to turn that into a level. Sure. Right? So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to take a look at the Mammoth Outpost. Ooh, look at that. It's so done. What, so. Yeah. It's, ship yeah, it. It's, it's, All right. Ship it. It's done. There you go. Um, so this is actually, this is done in a 3D art program. Uh, I asked Tramel what it was, but Tramel was like, I don't know, some art package. I'm like, <laughs> the expensive okay. one. So, you know, I just said 3D art package um, in there. So um, what they do is they, they look at it here first before the artist really dives in um, and does like these really intricate sketches and That's stuff like that. So they get the perspective correct. <clears throat> so Cliff, I, I'm going to ask you first. Um, so Mammoth Outpost, what, well, what is this? We are going to show, we're going to show the other concept. Mm-hmm. The, yep. the other shot, the other concept is a little clearer. So um, let's go, let's go to the next one. That's, it's, that's kind of boring. There, that's the that one. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's another one that's a little more descriptive that I'm hoping we can get to, but we'll get there eventually. Sure. I like high concept things. I like being able to pitch something in a very short period of time and you say, okay, I get that. So it's not just, you know, techie hallway or, you know, like, uh, you know, just boring shit. So something happens in the fiction of the world that causes a lot of destruction. And essentially the idea is, you know, Mammoth Mountain in California is actually split in two right down the middle. And the uh, transnational uh, supplement control, uh, transnational authority supplement control sets up an outpost there, continuing with the theme of a lot of these beautiful kind of Midwestern and California locations mm-hmm. that are being militarized. And the architectural style of theirs is kind of this Eastern Bloc kind of Quake Two architecture evolved into this kind of new world order of the future. And uh, it's essentially, you know, the plan is to make it as kind of a traditional two fort, but with the giant chasm in the middle that it has been built over after this event has actually happened. So it's kind of the you know high level concept, uh, mm-hmm. basically our version of a reimagined uh, fortress from inception. Hmm. So that's kind of you know the, the the me enthusiastically on Red Bull going into somebody's office and saying what the fuck I want to see. So. And uh, so, tra- good luck translating this. Okay. <laughs> so, so I, this is just kind of like a you know with with the actual environment in the in the in the background. I like that you have like from here. It's like you can see like there's a there's an old style kind of structured house that's just kind of been there. It's been there for a number of years. It's not destroyed or anything like that. Um, and let's go to the next one, which is, I think we'll see a lot more of the. There we go. Yeah, that's more of the money. So, show. and there's another one that is the current iteration of of it. So. I can definitely see a multiplayer map with that now. Well, I mean, my big thing is, you know, you need borders in a, a good, a tight 5 on 5 shooter like this. Uh, nothing irritates me more than saying, you're out of bounds, or having, a, you know, an alleyway where, like, you look like you can go down it and it's just a fucking invisible wall on your face. Mm-hmm. I understand, and I've said it before, why Battlefield has the whole get back to the battlefield, because they have to deal with jets and all this huge terrain and everything. You can't have a magical dome in it, because it's, if, if it's not sci-fi. But for us, there's things that we're striving to do within the fiction of, like, falling to your death off the mountain or having hazardous substances mm-hmm. that create borders in the map and nothing you know creates a better border than you know being that high up in the you know, atmosphere so, yeah. so Scott say like this came across your desk and yeah you're like we need you to make this into a map would you be excited about making that into like a level yeah I, I mean, think for me I get most excited about concept art that stays in perspective which is great that they're no, doing cool. that with the, yeah. the 3d I've been handed concept art before that was basically Escher and they're like, hey, <laughs> this looks amazing. Everybody signed up. Like, can you build this? And you're like, no. Um, so this is all, there's stuff here I can use. I mean, the first thing I'll do is look at it and be like, what's, you know, the layout isn't going to work perfectly from concept art. You know, it's just the way it is. But it's good uh, there's puzzles, uh, puzzle pieces here that I can take and kind of turn into Lego blocks. Uh, and so I'll try and identify the things that are key. Uh, like that tower back there seems like it's really important to help get the feel across. Um, so I'll probably... I'd almost go in Photoshop at points and just kind of like start outlining pieces that I could turn into models and, and put in the level. So Chris, let's go to the next one yeah. real quick because I think, so the next one is the current uh, near final and I can actually see like an additional outpost yeah. like behind there and it's a lot more fleshed out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this has even more stuff to yeah. pull from to be like, okay, because a lot of times you'll start a level and it's not very cohesive as far as the reality of it goes, but you know mm-hmm. that there are certain elements to it that make really good gameplay. Um, you know, the distance between cover, uh, where, where the respawns are, what does a respawn look like, 
Uh, and so you kind of start out really rough, make it really fun, and then generally you go back and pull in the pieces that will help make it look like the concept art in the first place. Um, and I think this is this is a great art style to pick from because everything's blocky, which is awesome <laughs> as a level designer because I start with blocks, and if it's going to end up looking with really polished blocks, that makes it easy. Um, and so, you know, like some of the fantastic things here are the, just the general concept, two spaces on a cliff. Yeah. Uh, that does help make it a lot easier for us to figure out boundaries. That's usually where a lot of early level designers will start some of their, their concepts. It's like, well, I'll just be on like the top of a skyscraper because I don't have to worry about anything because you fall to your death. Um, so that, that saves a lot of time right there trying to figure out the, the reasons for why you're contained in the space. Um, I think there's a lot of height variation in here that yeah, could be really interesting for gameplay. Yeah, people in the chat, too. They're talking okay. about the verticality. Yeah. yeah, so I think you could take some of these <clears> elements <throat> and kind of reconfigure them to make battlements. Um, you know, there's definitely line of sight issues that'll, that'll have to be solved if you were to actually just take this and build it one for one scale. Um, I think the bridge being on the low end there is actually pretty cool because it allows people a chance to possibly escape the usual fight at the main level. Um, so side routes like that are always useful. Um, some of the tricky parts, though, about trying to turn this into a level, I think where I'd, I'd find challenges is trying to integrate the parts of the cliff that the players can traverse and the ones that kill them. Um, so uh, I think that would yeah. be a bit of no, a challenge. I don't, I don't there's, like, there's like the, <clears throat> yeah. the steepness of it, right? If, yeah. it's, if it's like less than 45, it's good. And the other, either make it less than 45 <laughs> or almost vertical. Like yeah. You have to be really clear. It's like you know doing a cover shooter, what's cover? You have to be really clear about what's going to kill you and what's not. Exactly. So I think, I think that's something where I'd probably end up spending the most time in the prototyping phase is figuring out what cliffs you can run on and what will kill you. Um, so from okay, so from this standpoint, where would you go next if you were if you were to translate this into yeah. into a, a, a map? What would you do? I think the first thing is I'd, I'd work on the game mode because um, the game mode okay. is the motivation no, for the player. It's, no, totally. It's, it's exactly you got to tell the player where you want them, and they've got to be able to meet up with other players. I mean, you don't want people to be That's like, smart. "Okay, ready, set, go," and then they all scatter in what, opposite directions. What, what, what are some of the prime directives I've given you about the game mode? Uh, you know, it should be uh, should have a lot of momentum <laughs> shifts. Uh, it should be exciting, and it should be uh, it should start at one point, and by the time you reach the end, it should be a different experience. And with a bang, not a whimper. Yes. Uh, so high tension at the at the end, so a good climax uh, for the finish. Cool. Um, no, I didn't even think. So I mean, obviously, I'm not I'm not a designer, but I never even thought about it. it's like when you see this, it's like okay, we need to define the game mode that that's going to be on this map first, mm -hmm. and then go from there. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, uh, it'll make your life a lot easier in the end because. Yeah. Uh, You'll, you'll build spaces that are tailored around the end result. Um, so, like, you know, example, if we were to make this a CTF, uh, you'd want to make sure that when the guy was traversing back to his base, he couldn't just completely disappear. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be really important that players could track down the guy that stole it and feel like they had a chance at recovering the mistake they made. Um, so I'd make sure there weren't too many covered paths that you could just escape. And that's just, like, one element that you'd pick for, like, the center, because that's probably the most obvious. Um, you know, and then it comes down to... Uh, if this was CTF, you'd want both teams to be able to traverse back and forth. Um, and there's, a, there's a tough balance when you're doing maps with bridges like this because you want, you want people to be able to snipe the bridge. That's, that's a lot of fun. Uh, it gives the snipers a role for something. Um, when it comes to players' motivation to want to run across the bridge, you have to give them just the right amount of cover that they don't feel completely screwed by running out. Snipers opening. can't completely hold it down. Yeah, but at the same time, they can still sometimes affect you. So you know, ways you can solve that is kind of have interspersed line of sight blockers depending on where uh, you know where the positions are that you want the defenders to stand. Um, maybe he can see like 50% of the field and he's got a little bit of a window that he has to be really skillful at using to his advantage. Um, so that's probably some stuff I'd mess around with in here. Um, like in the picture here, the battlements are really large uh, and I don't think I'd let players have that much access to Yeah, the people are stuff. asking about like how this would translate size-wise, right? Yeah, I think I'd definitely pare this down. I think this is probably two to three times larger than it needs to be for uh, five on five. But, uh, yeah. Cool. I'm sorry, we're, we're looking at some of the questions here. Yeah, um, sure. Anything, anything I can answer? Um, oh, my God. Give me a second. <laughs> we need somebody to fill. Dance. Um, so I don't, I don't really know exactly. So Scorch Claw is asking, and, and maybe you might know this, at what point in game design do you feel comfortable designing and creating final maps? I mean, I don't... Yeah, so that's that's just sort of a, it's a, a process that process, evolves over right? time. Yeah, 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 I mean, I don't think there's ever a date you can set and say, like, you know, four weeks from now we're going to be ready to make final maps. It's something that you try to get to as quickly as possible, but uh, it just kind of happens on its the, own. The biggest thing about this game, you know, the move towards the game being a living product, though, is once it's in your hands, you know, our faithful, awesome users, you know, if there's things that aren't balanced or you love or hate, let us know, and we'll have a dialogue there. 
if you feel the spawns on one side are fucked up, and that's the overwhelming consensus of the community, we're going to address that issue the majority of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the, the biggest thing to take forward is, you know, in this new world order, almost nothing is, never, is ever final. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the best part is you're always gathering data and feedback, you know, from the first time you ship a map. And either you go back and fix that map where you say, actually, our efforts are better spent on a whole new mode and a whole new map. Yeah. Uh, and then you go that way. So I think, yeah, that's great. C, uh, so uh, CMAC Tarmac is asking, will there be grappling hooks? What do you mean grappling hooks? I think you'd, you'd have a better answer on that one. We have a, a lot of different mobility uh, mobility abilities in the game, a lot of different ways to traverse. We're, we're toying game. around with. Yeah, and grappling yeah. hooks are hard, right? My thing is, uh, you know, there haven't been a ton of them <clears throat> in a lot of FPSs. There's a limited one, I think, in Hardline that I played with in the beta or the alpha. Um, but, you know, the whole three-way of Quake, CTF, flying around the map, being able to attach to anything is very powerful. Uh, so if we have one, it will have some power, but it will have some sort of limitations either on the amount of times you can use it in a row or the famous put certain hooks and services that you can only attach to. So Kitten9 in chat is saying, game devs that are honestly interested in balance, question mark. I think, I mean, I think as a free-to-play game, and we talked about this last time, yeah. we are more inclined to have a balanced experience because we want to provide a service, a long-term service, to the yeah. people playing the game. And the game has to be balanced or you won't play it, right? Well, I mean, so, you make it as balanced as you can, but as I've said, you know, when you release it to hopefully millions of people, they're going to find shit that we, can't, we couldn't find in mm -hmm. a million years. And then you try and adjust it, you either introduce new content or you you patch it. And it's a balance is going to be an ongoing thing, right? Yeah. There's always you know, and there's always gonna be somebody who finds out a new way to use something to completely break our game. I'm okay with that fact. And I feel that balance is a bit subjective too, right? Like everybody has their own idea of balance. For some people yeah, it's you do exactly point. the same damage output as this guy, and that's perfectly balanced. Uh, for me I think is as long as the game is fun, it's probably in a balanced state. Uh, but I think when it, it's easier to say something's unbalanced when you maybe have one character in that's completely breaking the experience for everybody else in the server. And that's why I'd say we need to bring it back to the fun state. Chris, can we go to two <clears throat> real quick? Um, and I think we, we need to wrap it up here, but one last question. Um, where did it go? Uh, from uh, King Mega Games, will map environments change throughout the matches. I think that's it. You know, you've seen some games do that. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm split on this one, and I absolutely want to hear your opinion on this. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Much yeah me too. Um, on one hand, I kind of like it. You know, there was, a, I think, an advanced warfare level where you had to, like, get inside, and the map kind of shifted, and that was very interesting. The purist in me, I'm like, eh, maybe, maybe not. You know, the idea of, oh, extend the bridge, or the bridge comes back in. I found that a lot of the core users generally in FPSs, and this is a very broad statement, aren't big fans of it. Um, but people like initially showing up for that gimmick, and they, the first thing they do when they get really good at the game is turn that shit off. So, you know, I think if it was well integrated and it meant a lot to what our game type was, it could be cool. Other than that, I'm still kind of on the fence with it. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, uh, it's very specific to the game type. And I can see where some maps it's sort of designed where this is the experience where things change, but other maps it's, no, this is static and this is going to be the way you fight in that arena. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges that come in with making a really dynamic, shifting geometry level. Uh, one is, like, if somebody's a late joiner, they're not really quite sure what state the game is in, and yeah. they may never know that something was supposed to be yeah, the, the, the other ca way. The cart mode from TF2, right? Yeah. Yeah, we push it. Um, uh, well, that one's not as bad, because that's... At least you're always, you're always running to the same spot. I'm thinking more of like some of the battlefield things I've experienced where like the buildings collapse. Like I join in the server. And Level, I, Levolution. So I've always joined servers where they're all just dead. They're yeah. all destroyed. I don't think I ever played from the start. So uh, I don't know. I, I missed out on the Well, experience. whenever there's destructible stuff like that, what's the first thing everyone does? Blow it up. Blow it all up. And yeah. then that's, well, that's but your if you're, if you're trying to make a, a core competitive, especially if, like, if you're doing esports, right, for some of these games, mm -hmm. you would want to have a predictable environment. You don't want an environment that's constantly changing that's, because that, that injects a lot of random... Factors. But I mean, if, if you're doing a game mode where you know there's three there's three parts of it and it's kind of a push or a pull, you know you're going to need new spawn rooms to kind of you know become accessible or new weapon rooms or new environments in general. Yeah. So it's a very open ended question. That's very specific to the game type that's being built. And that's what I'd say. Yeah, I don't think it's good or bad. It's just which direction do you decide to go with it? So. All right. Well, guy, I can't believe it's already five fifty. That's crazy. We actually we actually went over a little bit on this show. We try to keep it a little contained, but that's okay. Um, thanks everyone for the question. Scott, is there anything that you want to you want to tell people before we jet? Uh, uh, no, just keep watching. I mean, we want to kind of keep talking as as we yeah, develop the game, and hopefully, more stuff that we're working on we can show you guys. So I'm excited for some of the stuff that's that we're prototyping. Cool, Chris. Can you go to the yeah. close? So another thing, uh, Leonard Nimoy died today. Yeah. Oh, which so. is um, I hate to end on this 
note that's yeah, sad. That's, I'm going to leave depressed. Well, but I think it's important that people... I grew up, you know, watching oh, we Star all did. Trek, we and all did. it's really sad, so I just wanted to kind of honor... Um, and his last tweet was so fucking I, poetic, too, and just... Yeah, so... More people you know, should be talking about this than the fucking dress, okay? Yeah. That's all I'm saying. So, it's sad, but we wanted to pay our respects, and, uh, yeah, you, everyone should as well. So, anyways, check us out on Boss Key. We're going to post all the assets that we have here, along with the PAX promo, all the details about the panel, and we're going to do another panel in Raleigh the week afterward on the 14th. The Wizard World? Wizard World. We're going to do a follow-up panel Wizard there. World. WW, I guess? I don't know. Um, so check out we have all the details they're going to be posted on bosskey.com and if you want to talk about the show go to our subreddit uh, the address is there you can find it on our website so flame away thanks guys thank you have a good one bye hey.